Wells. Uh, this is the Computational Intelligence Society History Committee interview series. Uh, my name is Don Wunsch. I'm the Mary Finley Missouri Distinguished Professor of Computer Engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla, Missouri. Uh, and we are in Arlington, Virginia on uh, September 10th, 2012, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, we're here to interview uh, Paul Werbos, the inventor of backpropagation, IEEE pioneer uh, winner, IEEE fellow, and many other honors besides. Uh, so, uh, Paul, if you would add to that your, uh, your affiliation and contact information. Well, I'm working at the National Science Foundation, uh, and my email there, it's on the NSF website, uh, pwerbos at nsf.gov. And I have my own website, www.werbos.com, which has a whole lot of other contact information. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great site. There's some wonderful publications you've put on there and opinion pieces, things that you might not find in a Google Scholar search, but very, very valuable things. So you should visit www.werbos.com. Um, and could you tell us about your formal education and training? Oh, um, I started out getting what amounts to an undergraduate major in mathematics while I was in high school at the University of Pennsylvania in Princeton. And then I got an undergraduate uh, degree in economics from Harvard, then master's in political economy from London School of Economics, and then a master's and PhD from Harvard. And, um, and those were in physics, right? And those were in applied mathematics. Oh. And I regard mathematics as a license to still try to understand the whole world and not be over-specialized. Because with mathematics, you can get very deep into many areas. And that was my intention from the beginning. Uh, so for the first degree uh, at Harvard, I had control theory, decision, and actually decision and control, and mathematical methods and quantum physics. And then the PhD basically was backpropagation, which in itself was cross-disciplinary. A third of the thesis was political forecasting using the second part, which was new statistical methods, more powerful than what people are using even now, made possible by the backpropagation algorithm with a chapter on the side saying we can use it for neural networks too. Uh, originally, I wanted to do the whole thesis on backpropagation for neural networks. But to make it acceptable to Harvard, I had to do all of these pieces and put them together. Wow. Wow, that's, uh, that's great. Um, what was your first job in engineering or science? Uh, depends on how you define it. Uh, it might so my first regular tenure job, uh, my regular full-time tenure track job was at the University of Maryland. And I was supposed to be the mathematics and methods person for a program on public policy. Now, I don't know if you call that engineering. It was mathematical methods, well, it was science. optimization, statistical analysis, but you know, public policy, <laughs> what do you call it? And then after that, I moved on to the Department of Energy. And again, it was combining backpropagation was part of the job. We found uses for backpropagation in large scale econometric models, which I built. Now, that's economics, it's policy, but there was also energy technology. Technology might be engineering. Mathematical mm -hmm. programs might be engineering. And it wasn't really till I came to NSF in 1988 that you could say my job was really engineering first and engineering clearly. And ever since 1988, it's been a lot of fun dealing with all the aspects of trying to develop new technology methods and science. And you've certainly had a hand in public policy since that time as well. So, um, well, uh, what was your first paper published? Uh, and in what publication and what title? Uh, uh, of course, your dissertation is, uh, is a very famous document. Uh, is, is that the one that you would mention, or is there another publication that... If the word is first, 
Um, there was a little journal called Kibernetica, based in Namur in Belgium. Uh -huh. And in 67 or 68, I have the citation on the web. In fact, the whole paper is on the web. I posted that, scanned it. That was, that was my first publication. It was called The Elements of Intelligence. And I was beginning to see how to do a mathematical model of intelligence in the brain, which could become artificial neural network intelligence. It was just the elements at that time. And it took a while to pull them together. But there were a lot of key ideas in that paper. Can that paper be found on wearables.com? Yeah, yeah, oh, it's good. there. Yeah. Uh, there's a section called Mind, and there's a section called Supplemental Papers. Is that also republished in Roots of Backpropagation? No, not oh, that one. Okay. No, not that one. Um, and there was only one other published paper I had before the PhD thesis. And that was um, on the use of backwards time to reconstruct the possibility of realism in physics. It was a quantum oh. physics paper published in Novo Cemento Letters. Wow, that's, that's great. The backwards time concept con connects to one of the concepts from my PhD as well, but that's another huh. discussion. Um, so uh, I guess the next answer is the same one, your first computational intelligence related paper. That would have been the Kibernetica paper, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, what persuaded you to, to study science applied math? Uh, you, you already said, I guess, that it allows you to work on anything. Were there some other motivators? Uh? Yeah, as, as I look at this historically, <laughs> The first question, what persuaded you to study engineering or science? I remember making up my mind when I was eight years old. Wow. Okay. Uh, and it certainly wasn't because either of my parents urged me to. Uh, I think that all of the stuff about space and Sputnik was in the air. I'm sure that influenced me. I remember seeing Tom Corbett you know, on the television. But when I have to say what really pushed me over the edge, um, I learned I was good at math. And I found some of my mother's old math books lying around the house. And then a babysitter said she was having troubles learning algebra. And I offered to try to help her when I was eight. I didn't know what I was talking about, <laughs> but I could understand her book. And she said, you understand this better than I do. She was such a nice girl. And mm -hmm. she left me the book. I feel I have a real debt of gratitude to her. So I learned algebra when I was eight. And after that, it was just sort of one thing after another. There were also some all about books, about all about the atom, all about the stars, and they kind of excited me. And I went out and, and uh, from weeding money, I, I bought a couple of books by Hoyle and Gamow, again when I was in it. So that, it just started the thing going. There wasn't any question of which way I was gonna go at that point. Um, as an undergraduate, however, by then I realized I was interested in neural networks. And as an undergraduate in Harvard, I found one half course in neuroscience, which I took, with a bunch of pre-meds. It felt kind of strange. Yeah, with the one freshman with a bunch of pre-meds. Um, and then basically nothing else. And I couldn't figure out what's the closest to neural nets that was in the course curriculum then. I ended up picking mathematics, decentralized optimization systems. And that was very useful. But for grad school, the argument was applied math gives me a license. I was still interested in policy, but I saw a lot of Harvard lawyers who just kind of got lost. Mm -hmm. you know? And I figured, okay, I have unique advantages here. I'll work with my comparative advantage. Even in public policy, it might help to know a little arithmetic. Good. Uh, can we pause this for a moment? Uh, just hit that. This one? Yeah. yeah, hit that one. Okay. Is there a person or event that influenced your decision uh, to choose the applied mathematics that you chose? Okay, if you said neural networks, I could have given some examples. Applied mathematics, if there was any person, ironically, it would be John von Neumann, oh. because I saw his theory of games long ago when I was young, and I have been in the shadow of his way of thinking my whole life, really. And uh, von Neumann talked about three great challenges he was into, uh, one of which really was neural nets. People don't give him credit for what he contributed to the neural network field. Uh, one was uh, the basis 
trying to understand quantum mechanics, what's really going on? And that's a real tough question. He was also interested in economic policy issues and in life. And so I guess I touched three out of four. <laughs> Did you ever get to meet him? I never got to meet him, no. And, and you said if we asked about neural nets instead of applied math, there'd be some names? It would be a little easier. Uh -huh. uh, for example, one event I can remember, I had a summer job after I graduated from the Moore School summer course in computers for people. Uh, I worked for one summer in Jefferson Hospital, um, also in Philadelphia under Dr. Karaman, and he had me read a book by Hebb, Organization of Behavior. Mm. And I had read things before in Artificial Intelligence, but Hebb's book really was uh, an inspiration. And one of the first things I wanted to do, I promised my old class back at the Moore School, I would deliver a talk on how do you translate Hebb's idea into a computer algorithm you could use to solve induction problems. And I thought Hebb formulated this idea very well. It should be easy. And then I started looking at it. Oops. I knew enough statistics to know, oops, this can't work. Correlation coefficients can't do all this stuff. You need a totally different approach. And so I had an incomplete in that course, but I kept thinking about it. And finally, sometime around my freshman, sophomore year at Harvard, I said to myself, okay, Hebb's idea of building a brain from emergent intelligence of one type of neuron basically will not work. And basically, it won't fit how brains do it. However, if you change the problem and say three types of neurons, each of which has its own learning rules, so there are three learning rules for three types of neurons, with that you really can build a universal intelligence. And that's really where backpropagation came from. It didn't come from some effort to do uh, exclusive or. That wasn't the motive. It was backpropagation was just one of the key tools to let you build a full intelligent system. And that's really where the adaptive critic, HDP, came from. And that gives you a universal intelligence, but not as powerful as the brain. And then after that, your levels and levels of, of greater power of the same basic mathematical principles. Mm -hmm. So that, that was certainly the challenge I was into. That was pretty clear. OK. Good. Um, well, uh, so some of this overlaps with the question about when you got involved in uh, in one of the core technologies because this was the late 60s is that right yeah so when i was an undergraduate mm -hmm. uh, i took the neuroscience course because it would help me with neural networks but i was also already deeply interested in the neural network challenge uh, back when i was in high school wow wow um and, and so these are the things that triggered your jump into that technology. And, and I guess this was your first computational intelligence related activity was this research that you were doing while you were still a student in the field of neural networks. Yes, that's right. Um, well, what was the major challenge that you faced in your pioneering research? You already alluded to the fact that Harvard uh, didn't think that it was enough to oh, okay. yeah, invent yeah. The, the neural network <laughs> algorithm that is used by 99% of the field, but uh, were there some other challenges in... in okay, well, the, the first challenge was the one I mentioned of how do you build an, and understand intelligent systems and map it into the brain. But I learned that hard as that challenge is, a much harder challenge is uh, how to communicate with the human species about that kind of thing. And, and yes, the experience with Harvard was part of it. I'm told that Einstein once said, or somebody once said, if you come up with a really radical new idea, a new paradigm, uh, you go through three stages before it's accepted. And the first one is, it's totally crazy. The next one is, uh, it really doesn't say anything new. And the third one is, no, we did it first. And I have certainly experienced that in spades. And the truth is, I'm still experiencing it today because uh, backpropagation was just one step on the way. Complete intelligent systems, adaptive critics, are another step. And this backwards time stuff in physics is another step. 
And figuring out the universe is one thing. Figuring out how to communicate with humans with all of our tribal taboos and hot buttons, even if you can do a mathematical model of it, it doesn't make it a simple system because there are so many hot buttons and so many tribal taboos and so many political factions playing games with each other. Knowing game theory doesn't protect you from the complicated realities of the world we live in. Of course, of course. Um, uh, well, uh, so you, you have made many contributions throughout your career. Which contribution gives you the greatest personal satisfaction? Well, in, in this context, uh, I would point to my two papers in neural networks in 2009 and 2012. Even though they don't have a lot, there's a lot of important stuff missing, they tree back to original sources. So they don't tell you how to fill in all the blanks but they provide the integration of a whole lot of other things that give the details to make it real. So the 2009 and 2012, that's in the computational intelligence field. Mm -hmm. There is stuff in the physics field I'm also kind of uh, excited by, but that's longer term. Uh, I do wonder sometimes, will people rediscover it in 50 years? <laughs> will I actually get it through the mainstream in the next five years? because it took longer for me to figure out some of that stuff. Um, in fact, I should be totally honest. When I was a couple years into grad school, there came a point when I said, well, I kind of know the basics of how you build intelligent systems. But this quantum stuff is just totally baffling. You know, I had courses from Julian Schwinger, who got the Nobel Prize in quantum field theory, and, and we got along pretty well, but it was clear there were some really hard problems. And I remember a moment when I thought to myself, should I do my thesis in this area or in the neural network area? And I said, you know, I'm not gonna solve this physics stuff even to my crude basic satisfaction. I won't know what's really going on in the universe in time for a PhD. So I'll pick the other one I'm deeply interested in and then I'll do the other one in my spare time as I figure it out. And I kind of feel this year, I've sort of kind of figured it out but it'll take a long, long time before that percolates through our culture, if ever. Well, I for one am glad that you chose the, the neural networks path. Um, what do you think that the impact that the Computational Intelligence Society, Neural Network Society, Neural Network Council, and International Neural Network Society has made on you? And of course, you're one of a handful of people who can say he's contributed to all of those organizations. Um, they have had a lot of impacts, and yet there's a lot of work left to do. Um, John Wynn was at this big neural network conference in Shenyang just a few months ago, and we got really deep into this. I, in one minute, I can't repeat everything. It's really critical that the cross-disciplinary activity has been institutionalized, made credible, been part of IEEE. That certainly saves the next generation from some of the problems I had when I was a lone voice in the wilderness and everybody was saying, this whole field is crazy. And it's funny how many people tried to take credit for it, who later, you know, who in the, in the beginning were saying, this is totally crazy, this is impossible. All of the people who said, no, I invented backpropagation, who at the time said, it could never possibly work. <laughs> you know, it's pretty crazy, some of the politics of this stuff. But, um, but on the other hand, we haven't become as well established as we should be. For example, the control theory community is smaller as a part of IEEE, but they have regular programs, better in Sweden than in the United States. In the United States, they're a little fragmented, but there are programs where you can get a complete PhD in control and learn the different kinds of control and, and the basic principles, at least in Sweden. Um, mm -hmm. But in the neural network field, we don't really have, that I know of, any PhD where you learn what I consider to be all the basic principles for neural nets for optimization and neural nets for prediction over time, drawing on all of the basic mathematical principles that allow you to build, use, and apply these kind of neural nets and connect them to the brain. We haven't yet established this yet. And in our society, there are centrifugal forces pushing people away from cross-disciplinary cooperation, making them non-productive, but they have their friends to help them out politically. 
and to address the real cross-disciplinary challenge, we have a long way to go to get society to pay attention to this challenge. I completely agree with you. The, 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 uh, things get too siloed and uh, there, there's a lot of background that it needs to be assembled to really make contributions in this area and there are a lot of impediments to assembling that background because of the lack of the type of program that you mentioned. It's, yeah. um, I, by so. the way, the tools are also important. Better mm -hmm. tools will make it a lot easier. Everybody and his brother can learn how to use forms of reinforcement learning that don't work. And they get taught in classes, this is a system that doesn't work. The tools that do work have been used by a few groups to have really great, impressive applications, many of which are proprietary. But we need to get the more powerful tools out to a broader community so that we can get more people playing. Yeah, that, that, that's certainly true. Um, what impact has our society made in engineering and science? I guess that kind of I, I kind of, I kind of yeah. said that already. Um, how do you envision the evolution of computational intelligence technologies? Do you see any expected confluence and any potential new entry? Okay, so here I give a bureaucratic answer, forgive me. It's like a government institution. Every good government institution has a core mission and then they have to put time into leveraging what they learn from their core mission into other things. And they have to have a balance. Uh, at NSF, I think of it as intellectual merit, and then the leveraging is broader impact. But it's not that simple. In the neural network field, we have a very important core mission. At some point in the coming century, if we work at it, we will be able to write mathematical specifications for general purpose learning systems that can learn to predict their environment and to make decisions as well as the smallest mouse can do, <laughs> to yeah. capture that learning capability and connect it to the wiring of the mammal brain. That's a very discrete thing. Yeah, and very appropriate goal. The, yeah. the, that would be a huge step forward yeah. from where we are now. And, and, and I regard that as a grand challenge to science, at least as important as what Newton did, just as discreet, just as mathematical, just as fundamental, just as game changing. But we haven't had our way of thinking change enough to accommodate the mathematical tools we already have to pursue this goal. In principle, we should be able to do it in 10 to 20 years, but I look at how slowly we learn new things, how slowly the academic world accommodates itself, how long it takes us to get around to doing things we should have done 20 years ago. And at that rate, I think we'll be lucky if we do it within the century. We could do it faster, but, but the political barriers to moving that fast are, are pretty overwhelming. So that's a discrete goal, but that's not the only thing important in computational intelligence. There's news just this week that people in genetics are noticing that this stuff they call junk DNA is a little more interesting. It's possible that on the horizon, maybe 20, 30 years from now, we'll discover there is a possibility for understanding real genetic systems as real learning systems, obviously meta-learning beyond the individual organism. Mm -hmm. And we may be able to realize what are the adaptive functions that some of this so-called junk DNA is performing. And there's a lot of very interesting mathematics in that area, not totally unrelated to von Neumann's question, what is life anyway, mathematically? So that's another opportunity, but I don't see it really on the horizon yet. You know, the mammal brain is clearly on the horizon and it looks like it's gonna take us 100 years. That next one, it might take a little more preparation than what people are ready for right now. Although the forces are kind of aligning up because of the huge economic incentives for understanding that. Although the economic incentives for uh, learning systems are huge too, if people yeah. could only realize how enormous they are. Um, well, uh, so that sort of relates to the next question about did you, do you predict any scientific or technological breakthrough involving computational intelligence? So I guess the, uh, the mouse brain, the, the <laughs> real understanding of genetic regulatory networks, these things would be huge breakthroughs that certainly will need our technology to do it. Are, are, yeah. there, are there some others that... Okay. But 
let me emphasize what I was just talking about with genetics is not what people normally call genetic regulatory networks. Oh, okay. Normally people are talking about sort of PDE models to characterize what goes on inside the cell. And that's a nice, very primitive way to begin to address some aspects of von Neumann's question, what is life? But there's other work involving things like boundary conditions and eigenvectors and stuff like that, which the Russians have looked into important to that question. But what I'm really talking about is the larger system of you know, billions of organisms with different DNA, living and dying and evolving, and how the structure of the DNA, which is, I guess, part of the regulatory network business, how the structure of the DNA enables a meta-learning capability, which is really at the multi-organism level. It's at the population level. And how in the world does this coding system, which I guess does live at the regulatory level, implement a cross-organism learning system? Because it's the learning across the population which really defines that process. It's fascinating, but <laughs> When I say I think it's too hard, you've got to understand what I consider doable <laughs> is already considered impossible by most people. So yeah. I'm not okay. suggesting somebody go off and do this tomorrow, unless there's somebody brilliant enough out there who feels prepared to try. Well, it, 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 it's certainly a daunting problem. The multi-genomics people are scratching the surface, but just barely. It, it's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, well, do you have any final comments uh, about uh, about the whole topic, either the the field, the the, uh, the the development of the society, the development of the field, your what you've uh, uh, you know life lessons, career lessons that you've learned as you've worked in this in this area? I feel a whole lot of gratitude, particularly to Dan Levine and Robert Cosma, for setting things up so that. I could talk about those questions at huge length in my papers in neural networks. And mm -hmm. in two minutes, I won't say a lot more than what those papers already say. Yeah, so everybody needs to read those papers, clearly. <laughs> uh, 2009 and 2012, and these are, uh, these are your papers in, oh, yeah. that, in yeah. that field, in, in that uh, journal. Okay, well with that, I'll thank you very much for giving us this interview, right. Paul. And, and thank you, Doug. Uh, really a pleasure. <laughs> So, yeah, um, just click that. Okay, could you suggest any changes to improve the interview? <laughs> to be honest, not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And could you recommend any other researchers who should be interviewed? It's, again, it's a little hard because I don't know the present list and I don't know the grand strategy for using these interviews. Um, and let's see how creative I can be. I can, I, I'm usually most creative at 3 in the morning <laughs> and it decreases. At this time of day, I tell people I can emulate an intelligent system by drawing on my associative memory. <laughs> However, actual creativity for that <laughs> you know, three in the morning is when it comes. Um, so other important reviewers. Let's see how creative I can be right now. I'm not sure I can be that creative at this moment. Um, it's tough because almost everybody I know is in one little piece of it. Uh, or they're developing an important piece of it. <laughs> or they're recently dead. Uh, there was a guy I recommended for the Pioneer Award, uh, Jim Albus, mm. and I'm really sorry that that suggestion never got very far because Albus did have good credentials. In the meantime, he's died, and the sad thing is at his memorial special session of a conference, um, they had a video talk where he described how he was the one who basically created all these DARPA programs for the last five years that got them back involved in neural networks again. And I didn't know all that. And oh. his presentation of the logic was pretty interesting. And it made me think, God, and here I am talking to his wife every other day. We should have really talked about it. 
because we could have made more progress by joining forces together a little more effectively. But as you know, we now have Dan Hammerstrom at DARPA, so life is not over yet. Yeah, good guy. Okay, well, thanks again, Paul. And, okay. And okay, it. thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Don Wunsch with Missouri University of Science and Technology. I'm the Mary K. Finley Missouri Distinguished Professor there. Uh, and this is uh, September 10th, 2012. We're in Arlington, Virginia, interviewing Paul Werbos. He's an IEEE Pioneer Award winner from the, what was then the Neural Network Society, now the Computational Intelligence Society. IEEE fellow and inventor of backpropagation. So, uh, Paul, if you would, uh, if you would give us uh, your additional contact information. Okay, um, I'm at the National Science Foundation, and my email there is pwerbos at nsf.gov. It's also in the staff directory, which is posted on the web. And uh, there's a lot more information at my personal website, www. Dot werbos dot com. I'm going to start that over because the. Hi, I'm Don Wunsch. I'm the Mary K. Finley Missouri Distinguished Professor of Computer Engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology. And uh, I'm conducting interviews for the IEEE Neural Network Society, uh, Computational Intelligence Society History Committee. Uh, today is September 10th, 2012. We're in Arlington, Virginia to interview Paul Werbos. Uh, Paul is the inventor of backpropagation. He's IEEE fellow, IEEE Pioneer Award winner. And, uh, and so, Paul, would you tell us uh, your current uh, contact information? Okay. Uh, I'm working at the National Science Foundation. My email there is pwerbos at nsf.gov. It's also in the staff directory. And I have a personal website, www.werbos.com, which has some further connections. Yeah, some great papers in there. And uh, could you tell us about your formal education and training? OK. So um, I got into mathematics when I was very young. And so I completed what amounts to a full major uh, in pure mathematics while I was in high school taking courses at University of Pennsylvania and Princeton. If you've ever read the book A Beautiful Mind about John Nash, they talk about people hanging out in those easy chairs including even a couple of young high school students. Well, I was one of them, the youngest of them. Um, and then after high school uh, I went to Harvard. I knew I was interested in neural networks at the time and the course catalog didn't have a whole lot on that subject. So as a freshman, I took the one neuroscience course I could take as an undergraduate. You know, one freshman mathematical guy with a whole room full of pre-meds. And, um, and after that, I decided to major in economics because that was the closest I could find to addressing the question of a distributed system that makes optimal decisions. And frankly, the math made it easy and gave me time to do stuff with neural nets on my own time. And it has some relevance to public policy, which I've always been interested in. And then for graduate school, uh, I knew that mathematics would give me a license to stay broad, not to become stovepiped. And so applied math PhD was pretty straightforward. Um, I, I did digress for a master's degree in international political systems from London, and then master's and PhD in applied math at Harvard in decision and control quantum physics and mathematical methods, and then the backpropagation thesis, which was also multiple disciplines. And, and your advisor was? Ah, an interesting question. Um, when they looked at what I wanted to do, the applied math committee at Harvard said, no one person can really cover all this. So they divided it up. And there was a statistics section led by Mosteller. Uh, there was a mathematical methods section, so really Bossert of Harvard. If anybody oversaw the mathematical backpropagation part, it was Bossert, although Larry Ho definitely showed up. Um, he was very skeptical that you could ever use backpropagation for neural nets or that it would even work, but I proved it would work by proving 
the chain rule for order derivatives. And that allayed a lot of their anxieties. And then there was a section on political forecasting, applying all this stuff to predicting political things 100 years ahead of time. And that was under Carl Deutsch, who was my main thesis advisor. And you also worked with Schwinger, right? Uh, for the physics part, which was more the master's degree, uh, I was a student of Julian Schwinger, who developed quantum field theory. And it was a good interaction. But uh, by the time I got the PhD, it was clear it was going to take more than just five years to figure out what's really going on in quantum field theory. And after 40, 50 years, I think I finally do. But I knew I wasn't going to figure that out in time for a PhD. Um, so uh, what was your first job in engineering or science? Depends on how you classify jobs. <laughs> Um, my first regular real job uh, as an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, they hired me in to be the quantitative person in a new cross-disciplinary public policy program. So I was using methods like backpropagation and robust statistics and utility theory and game theory to try to understand public policy, but it was public policy. And then I shifted from there to the Department of Energy, which was again cross-disciplinary. We were overseeing uh, energy models. I developed a lot of large-scale econometric models, but backpropagation was a key tool to make these models work and predict well using real energy data. And technology was a critical part of the future of the energy. So the job was partly technology, partly economics, partly backpropagation. They called me an economist then, because sort of the economist ruled the place, and I knew how to think as an economist. But then finally, in 1988, uh, I shifted to NSF, and I've been in the engineering directorate ever since. Hmm. Great. So uh, what was your first paper published? I forget whether it was 67 or 68, but it is on my website probably in the mind section under supplemental papers. There was a little journal called Kibernetica from Namur in Belgium, and the paper was called The Elements of Intelligence. I had already been thinking hard about how do you build a neural network-based intelligence system that mimics what's in the brain. And uh, I had a lot of the elements there, a lot of the key ideas we, we later talked about with adaptive critics. Uh, backwards flows of information, Freud, dynamic programming. It was all in there in that 67, 68 paper, but it wasn't fully integrated yet. Before the thesis, which was in 74, I had just one other paper, which was in Nuovo Cimento Letters uh, on how to use backward time effects to explain what's going on in quantum theory. Oh, great. And uh, what persuaded you to study engineering or science? I, I think we already did that. It started when I was eight. Uh, I just already knew the mathematics and science was interesting to me. And I can remember telling my parents when I was eight years old, they asked me, what are you going to do when you grow up? I said, I don't know. I'm really interested in mathematics, but I'm really interested in what I see in astronomy. They said, oh, you'll be an astrophysicist. So I told everybody I would be an astrophysicist. At 12, I was asking myself questions about what is the meaning of life. So I was really getting deep into philosophy and politics. But then a couple years later, I said, you know, solving these problems in philosophy and politics, you've got to understand the human mind. And I read Hebb when I was still in high school, just before I went to Harvard. And Hebb's book really inspired me a lot. But I think you already have that on tape. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, well, I, I, th I think that we, we, we've done a couple of versions of this recording, but I, I think that this is, uh, I, I think you should cover the, uh, is there a person or event that influenced you? So you mentioned, uh, uh, go ahead and explain about Hebb's influence on you. and, and, and Yeah, so and for the neural network field, it would be one thing. For mathematics and applied math, it would be a different. Yeah, so uh, go ahead so, and explain them both. So, yeah. so for, for, for mathematics, it was really just something that 
happened to me, you know, like a babysitter when I was eight who left me her algebra book. She was a nice babysitter, and you know, even at eight I had some male hormones, so probably that influenced me, to be honest. Uh, I was going to Catholic school, and everybody said, don't study math, you'll be a freak. That probably got me to study it harder, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but at the end of the day, um, the only single name I could mention as inspiring me in math was John von Neumann. And I have felt as if I've been in the shadow of von Neumann ever since I was eight. Um, in some ways, I think von Neumann charted a path that a lot of people forgot about. And sometimes, in moments of delusions of grandeur, I think maybe I'm the only person on earth who is still following through to try to complete the visionary program that John von Neumann had in all the critical areas where mathematics can help us understand life much more deeply than we do as yet. Are there some, some of his papers or books that you think are most important for people to read? Or is it just his collected body of his literature? Well, one of the ones I read when I was young was The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. Um, he has a book in quantum physics, which is great, but it's not for everybody, and it's kind of hard to find. The What is Life book, Reproducing Automata, didn't excite me as much. Um, so, and some of his writings on neural networks are also kind of hard to find. It was kind of scary to me, because here's John von Neumann answering fundamental questions, charting a vision for the future which is viable, and nobody is reading his papers, even 20 years later, even after the whole world knows what a powerful thinker he is. I found myself saying, God, this is really scary. If I write things, you know, I won't have quite the cachet von Neumann did. You know, what, what's going to happen? Are we ever going to make progress in these areas if, if we forget so easily? So, um, but right now in the neural net area, you don't really have to go back to von Neumann. We do have stuff that captures a lot of that. Um, and the other one is HEB then. And so in the neural network field, as I think it over, Hebb's book, I have to confess, I also read Computers and Thought, like when I was 15 or 14, uh, from a computer course in the Moore School uh, for high school students in computers. Minsky had a good paper there. Minsky's paper really got me thinking. He was going to use reinforcement learning to understand and replicate intelligence. Only later, when he discovered he couldn't get there by hacking, did he you know, join the dark side. But, but the bottom line is, he started with a really good vision. It just took a little more mathematical power to go ahead and implement the vision and not just give up at the first you know, twitch. And so by joining the dark side, you mean go over to symbolic AI approaches? A, a variety of things like that. And, yeah. and, and uh, let me not get into that world and, and all of the barnacles that live in that world. <laughs> But, but yeah, Minsky's chapter in Computers and Thought by Feigenbaum and Feldman and Hebb's book were, were really um, important in my thinking. Great. Well, we've, uh, uh, we, we've re-recorded the first questions because I think they got corrupted, but then I think we've got the rest of the interview now. So, but I will say thank you again. Oh, thank you. <laughs>